So desert is a, a fairly sparse looking uh, landscape and uh, it tends to not have a lot of big trees or big things in the way. So the grasslands and the savannas and the deserts and the tundra, things without a lot of trees are going to be windy. And so you can see these sand dunes have been, the soil has been picked up and sorted into sand in different places and deposited by the wind and it gets sculpted into these, these beautiful patterns. But this is not what most of the desert looks like. Most of the desert um, has uh, plant life and animal life uh, throughout. Actually quite a bit of diversity in the desert. So we know we have major bands of deserts at 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And uh, we know why, because you know about Hadley cells and that uh, cool, drier air pushing forward down on the planet's surface. Deserts occupy about one fifth, 20% of the Earth's land surface. So most of the Earth is, is water, but if we just look at the 30% of the Earth that is land, about 20% of that is desert. Water loss usually exceeds precipitation. So you have more water um, evaporating into the air than falling down onto the earth. The soil is extremely low in organic material. There's just not a lot of dead organic material lying on the surface of the soil. And the plant cover then tends to be spread out. It can be absent or it can be sparse. And that is because there's only limited water. So you need to have enough space. The plants will outcompete each other if they're too close. The animal abundance is low, which means you don't have huge herds of things in the desert, but you have quite a variety of things. So you have uh, some, you can have high biodiversity, a lot of different types of species, but you don't necessarily have large populations of anything in the desert. The animals have very strong behavioral adaptations that allow them to live in the desert environment. When we talk about um, uh, water relations we will talk a lot about these adaptations humans um, have been uh, spending more time in the desert uh, so so uh, humans had uh, originally uh, shifted away from uh, living in desert areas because of the lack of water but uh, now human populations who are able to control what we do have spent more time in the in the desert area and uh, and are tapping into the groundwater, which is a problem trying to maintain uh, water, sustainable water supply. When we look at the uh, deserts around the world because they are such a harsh and difficult environment for things to live in the things that live in them uh, tend to have ado adapted to uh, or adopted the same strategies or survived if they have similar strategies and this is showing you um, uh, the strategies of uh, two different plants from two different deserts. We've got um, on the left side, we've got a cactus in North America. And on the right side, we have a euphorbia in Africa. And they, they look like very similar types of plants, but uh, they're actually unrelated. So these are, have evolved the same traits, um, but living in, in different continents. When we look once again at our distribution of the deserts, uh, we can see these bands at uh, 30 degrees, uh, approximately 30 degrees north and south of the equator. But uh, we also see these bands, remember we talked about those rain shadows of the mountains. We also see these bands in the rain shadows of the mountains. And so um, that's where the water had been uh, emptied out of the air after it had come from the oceans and pushed up the mountains. And then when you get on the other side of the mountains, you've got no water left. Uh, we can see uh, that the uh, Compared to the other biomes we've talked about, these have very low precipitation totals, 86 millimeters, 15 millimeters, 124 millimeters a year. Uh, in this uh, Yuma, Arizona, we can see that throughout the year, the, the uh, amount of rainfall line is always below the temperature line, which means there's never really adequate rainfall um, throughout the year. 
and then uh, here we have in Chad we've got exactly the same problem so they have basically a drought year-round in the, the the Arizona one and the Chad one when we look at the Mongolia one I showed you it, this particular climate diagram in the last lecture and we could see that in the winter time there is adequate rainfall but at that time the temperatures are below freezing so this is a cold desert which has a winter and so at, at that time all of that is frozen all that rainfall is actually precipitation is, is frozen in the form of snow so the only time they really have adequate water for for plants to grow is going to be in the early spring when that all that snowpack melts and then you get this uh, flush of things growing in the spring the um, the spring the word for spring is vernal uh, try to get you the spell you the word here vernal v-e-r-n-a-l and we talk call the spring um, equinox the day first day of spring the vernal equinox and uh, so this is a vernal bloom of, of plants a spring bloom of plants that you'll get in those cold deserts so deserts are lands where evaporation exceeds rainfall evaporation rates can be 10 7 to 50 times True deserts have less than 10 inches of rain per year, which is 25 centimeters. Semi deserts have two to three times that, but they still have high evaporation rates. They have very low humidity. Humidity is moisture in the air, and, and uh, air, water vapor in the air holds heat. It is actually a greenhouse gas, it's something that holds heat and warms up the air. Um, if you don't have any water in the air, then when the sun goes down, the nights get cold. There's no heat being held in the air. So they will have uh, very hot days, but very cold nights. And a lot of organisms time their uh, reproduction uh, to the rainfall events, which are infrequent, but usually uh, when they do get rainfall, it's usually a thunderstorm. It's something very heavy. When we look at the organisms that live in the desert, we can classify them by how they deal with the drought. And we can talk about the plants and animals as either being evaders of drought or resistors to drought. So an example of an evader uh, would be a plant that survives through the drought uh, in the form of a seed. So they'll, during the wet season, they will uh, germinate and grow and reproduce. Uh, when there is like a thunderstorm, you'll see the desert will bloom. And then uh, they will produce lots and lots of seeds that will sit in the soil. And they could sit in the soil for years waiting for the next big rainstorm so they can go through the process again. Animals may hibernate if it's in a cold area or estivate if it's in a hot area which means that they can dig down in burrows they can go down in the mud under where the ponds were when it did rain and they can just live down there uh, not really doing anything until they get another opportunity so it's a dormancy during a dry period um, the picture here is a spadefoot toad and when it rains it emerges from the earth in order to uh, reproduce and then just crawls back down into the mud after it's reproduced and waits for the next rain um, birds will um, migrate so they will come when there is ponds and when there's water and rainfall and they will leave when when there's none insects will um, uh, emerge when if there's rainfall and then disappear some things like plants can't come and go uh, the, if they're perennials or they're sort of uh, left sitting there and what they will do is uh, plants will tend to grow deep roots where there's a lack of rain so that the, the root mass underground is going to get as deep as possible trying to tap into the groundwater and that way they um, don't have to worry as much about whether it's raining out uh, then and so you get these woody shrubs that 
that are able to get re deep down into the into the soil and you'll see a lot of succulents uh, things like the cacti that have thick stems when it does rain they will swell up their stems to store the water some of the animals that are out there all the time whether whether it's a, a rainburst or not have be behavioral adaptations uh, many are nocturnal they only come out at night and uh, and so that's when it's cooler and so that they aren't going to lose as much moisture some have physiological adaptations and they don't have to drink water so the kangaroo rat has super kidneys and um, it gets whatever water it needs out of the seeds when you go through cellular respiration one of the products of cellular respiration is going to to be water if you remember your well, of course you remember your general biology you had um you had glucose which is c6 h12 o6 and you have oxygen you go through cellular respiration and you produce water and carbon dioxide and so this water this is a metabolic source of water and they have super kidneys that will concentrate the urine so that they can get rid of waste without losing water and they produce little uh, crystals instead we had this video the last time uh, as a brief introduction and so i'm just going to play it again because i think it, it gives you a very good over overview Biomes are major communities of organisms that have a characteristic appearance and are distributed over a wide area defined largely by vegetation and regional variations in climate. Ecologists recognize between 8 and 14 major categories of biomes. The most commonly used terms to identify biomes include tropical rainforest, savanna, desert, temperate grassland, temperate deciduous forest, temperate evergreen forest, taiga, and tundra. Moisture and temperature are key environmental factors in determining which biomes are found where. Tropical rainforests receive 140 to 450 centimeters of rain per year and contain at least half of the Earth's species of plants and animals. The soil in tropical rainforests is not nutrient-rich. Most of the nutrients are held in the plants. Savannas are grasslands that border the tropics and receive 75 to 125 centimeters of rain per year. This environment is characterized by alternating rainy and dry seasons. Savannas are often inhabited by huge herds of grazing animals that migrate in response to the seasons. Deserts receive less than 25 centimeters of rain per year. Vegetation is sparse and survival depends on water conservation. Temperate grasslands are found halfway between the equator and the poles. These temperate regions are characterized by fertile soil. Temperate deciduous forests occur in regions with warm summers, cool winters, and plenty of rain. Dominant species of trees include oak, maple, ash, and hickory. Temperate evergreen forests occur in regions where winters are cold and there is a strong seasonal dry period. The taiga consists of a great ring of northern forests consisting of coniferous trees. This ecosystem is one of the largest on Earth, with long, cold winters and most of the limited precipitation falling in the summer. In the far north, above the taiga, few trees grow. The grassland, called tundra, is open, windswept, and often boggy. Trees are small and confined to regions near lakes and streams. Large grazing animals, including reindeer and caribou, as well as carnivores, such as wolves and foxes, live in these areas. 